I, I will first say thank you, Mark, for your positive comments. And uh, the afternoon is already getting late, but I do want to say that even though one of the things I least want to do in, in, in my life is to get in front of the camera, the uh, positive feedback from people over this past year's time or so has made it worthwhile and knowing that some people have found these programs to be worthwhile has um, made me much more willing to do it and also to do a better job. So thank you everybody for your positive feedback. Um, yeah, Chris, I actually worked in a rose garden for 10 years. I knew that. My um, A good part of my career has been, you know, total immersion in the group of plants, whether it was roses or the three and a half years I worked for the American Camellia Society, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I ended up taking working on, on an estate garden. Um, knowing almost nothing about roses because of, in a very fine uh, landscape plant ID class in college, the teacher said roses aren't worth growing. And what I discovered, there's a whole lot more to the rose, uh, roses than just hybrid teas. And I know I started off the tour by saying that uh, uh, at this point in gardening history, it's sort of the uh, best of times and worst of times to uh, steal that line from Charles Dickens. Um, because we are at a time when breeders have really focused on breeding uh, disease resistant roses that we do not need to spray uh, for uh, fungal diseases, um, specifically black spot. Um, and, you know, they have created these things with glorious clean foliage and beautiful flowers that are no more trouble than a hydrangea or Rosa Sharon or any other landscape shrub. Um, so that's that's what's so good about, uh, you know, growing roses nowadays. And the bad thing is we have this absolutely dreadful disease known as rose rosette disease, which we can work with and we can deal with, but it, it takes a, a degree of the carefree nature of the modern roses away from uh, the equation of growing roses. Um, so is that enough introduction, Chris? Or sure, it certainly could be. So how about if we go to the tour stop number one? And I just didn't uh, include just uh, like one plant in the thing. I think this one might have three or four different plants just kind of grouped together. And I mentioned earlier that we have six tour stops that we're going to cover. Just kind of broke it up into um, uh, five to 10 minute segments or so. I think a couple of them exceeded 10 minutes. And we're going to break after each video and that'll be a good time for the Q&A. So we definitely will welcome the questions at that time. You can come in and ask them on, online, either in the chat or of course, by unmuting yourself. We'd love to hear from you. So let me hunt down the first video and I will get that one going. As I mentioned, there is a huge amount of breeding going on to breed disease-free roses. And, you know, look at this guy. The foliage is perfectly clean. It's perfectly clean all through the growing season. And, you know, this might be its best flush of bloom, but it blooms very heavily all through summer into fall. And um, one of the uh, first disease-free roses to be sort of widely uh, uh, propagated and, and planted by the public were, were the knockout roses. Uh, this, is, this particular rose is not a knockout rose, but it is bred by the same breeder. And I'm kicking myself this morning because I talked to my best friend, Michael from college last night, and he knows the breeder of the knockout roses. And I know it's one of his because all of his cultivars start with R-A-D, which are the first three letters of his last name. And that's what I wanted to be able to share with you what his name is. He, he worked for Star <laughs> Roses, uh, which is a big wholesale nursery I based in uh, Pennsylvania, but I, I'm sure they have many, many uh, locations. But it's, it's that modern example where we have a cultivar name and a trademark name. And nowadays, very often, the cultivar name Thank is you. not a very user-friendly one. And this one's not bad at all. It's Rad Treasure. 
but like the original knockout rose, the one that's sort of a redder version of this coral color. Um, knockout is the trademark name, but the real um, cultivar name is Radraz, R-A-D-R-A-S. Uh, no pronounceable, but like a lot of cultivar names nowadays, uh, you know, might include numbers and letters without vowels or consonants without vowels. So you sort of need to know more, but if you go in a garden center and you look for uh, Tahitian treasure, um, you'll come up with this rose. The tricky thing with this modern situation of cultivar name and trademark name is uh, the wholesale grower could supply multiple nurseries with rad treasure, but they a trademark name doesn't necessarily have to stay with the same, um, you know, all, it, this cultivar could appear with several different trademark names. Anyhow, that wasn't very rose related, but um, a really phenomenal rose. Um, but it also makes the point that roses don't have to be in a rose garden. Um, you know, one can grow roses without having a rose garden, just treat them like any other shrub and include them in, in uh, you know, mixed plantings. All right. Well, thank you, Dick. I, that I w was having the same thought. You telepathically sent that. Yeah, this was planted in 2011. Dick has learned that um, um, we often have the accession number on the back of the label. The accession is unique to this plant, and it's 110236. And the first two digits uh, referred to the year, so 2011. Um, and it was the 236 new accession in 2011. So it was probably also planted in 2011, but our data, database would indicate the actual planting date. And that is, oh no, it's actually three plants. Three plants yeah, that probably could, bushes. yeah, if you, I just, I can see three separate plants. The blooms are bigger than knockouts. Oh yeah. Yeah. Knockouts never get that big. Right. And um, Knockout is a series, and he, I, I guess he was looking for a sort of uniformity through them. Um, yeah, but we're going to see another one of his introductions in a minute. This is bred by the same person that bred the first rose we saw. Um, again, starting with R-A-D for his last name is Rad Prov. The trademark name is... Orchid Romance, and uh, Carol indicated that she could smell it already. I don't know if you're all smelling it, but not only is it a, well, you know, I shouldn't say it is a pretty flower because that's opinion, but it's a pretty flower with really nice fragrance and beautiful glossy green foliage, and it blooms all summer. Um, I've not, you know, I don't get out very much. I don't go to a lot of garden centers, but I don't know how readily available it is, but maybe if you don't find it in the garden center, you could find it from a mail order nursery. And this actually, um, Edith Edelman designed the perennial border. When was that? It was last century. Um, oh, in the very late seventies, it got planted. Um, maybe early 80s. Um, and then uh, I started working as a volunteer on the perennial border in 1985. And then we both ended up leaving the area for about 10 years, um, starting uh, the beginning of this century. And um, in the 10 years absence, somebody planted this rose in here. And we actually transplanted it to the um, uh, rose garden thinking we had removed it from here, but it regrew from a little piece that was left behind in the ground. So uh, it has a good, strong constitution as well. Nowadays, a lot of roses are, are rooted rather than grafted. So if they die to the ground, what regrows will be the same as what you originally planted. In the rose world, are flower forms classified to the degree that they are in the camellia world, where you have singles, semi-doubles, formal doubles, peony formed, and anemone formed. Um, I, not, not to the same degree in the rose world. I don't think there's quite the same variety. This, this would be uh, 
you know, a double, but it, it doesn't have that T-rose shape, the high pointed bud. Um, you know, this is more characteristic of the old European roses. Um, you know, at some point on, on this tour, I was going to um, talk about the history of roses and maybe we'll save that for a few more minutes when we end up in the rose garden. Um, it's actually, I, I had, had not realized this morning that in May we switched from one o'clock to nine o'clock, but on a warm day today, it's, it's better that we're seeing these roses now rather than in an almost 90 degree afternoon because a lot of the flowers quickly fade when it's that warm. All righty, everyone. That was the first video. So now is a great time for some questions that you can put in the chat or better yet, just come out here and ask them online. And I will say that I have been enjoying the Tahitian treasure for a long time, probably since that one was ever first put in the garden. I gave you the record. Um, you can see it in the chat. You can click on it yourself, see when we planted it. That's been a beautiful plant for a long time. Its foliage is very clean and big, beautiful flowers. Any questions, anyone? There were a lot of questions on the tour. I got rid of that part during the video, so questions? Okay, Doug, how about while we wait for the question, do you have any um, uh, additional comments to make about those? Oh, I don't know. They're both really good examples of the roses that are available now that have been bred first and foremost for disease resistance and they're, they both are really good performers. Um, and that orchid romance, um, it, it's one of my favorites amongst the modern ones because the fragrance is so good and the foliage is so clean. Cool. Well, I'm not seeing any questions, which is quite remarkable quite because that tour group that you had the other day um, on the uh, in-person tour, you had a lot of questions. Yeah. There we go. We just got one from Judy. She's wondering if any of these are root knot nematode resistant. Um, you know, in all my years with roses, I've never had problem with root knot nematode. Is that a problem that roses suffer from? Can anyone help me with that? I've never had an issue with my roses, but I've never had an issue with root knot nematodes. I've had trouble with um, voles eating the roots off. Yeah, that's that's definitely true. Uh, kind Do person. Do you fertilize your roses? Excuse me. Okay. Do you fertilize your roses? Well, I'm going to say what I always say is, um, you know, get your soil test and add fertilize based on what the soil tests say you need. Uh, we did fertilize our rose garden this year um, just because we I felt we needed to give them a, a you know a shot in the arm. But if uh, the roses that have been planted for a while um, probably didn't need it, but we had a bunch of newly planted roses that seemed like they needed a shot in the arm. There's a bunch of um, questions in the chat. Yep, I, they've been coming in. Someone commented yeah. that they were too stunned about our news to ask any questions, but they've gotten okay. over it and they're coming in with the questions. So that's great. Yeah. Um, uh, where, where was the first one? I thought that was a good one. Oh, well, they were asking just, what kind of roses we uh, that you show. Were those all shrub roses, Doug? Yeah, most of the, ro the, the, the first two are definitely shrub roses. They're not, well, you know, I would classify roses primarily as either shrub roses, meaning self-supporting ones, um, and the other main group would be climbers. The English talk about climbing shrubs, the woody plants that climb. Um, and then you do have ground cover roses. The drift are sort of like ground cover roses, but the old fashioned ground cover roses were things that could be trained up as climbers, but it, um, but it also could just be used as widespread ground covers. Um, I think in the tour, no, we did we did look at at least one climbing rose. There's fewer modern disease resistant um, climbing roses. Um, I, I guess the breeders just aren't producing as many climbers as shrubs. Shrubs are sort of lower maintenance because you don't have to work to train them up on a support. Okay, another question, uh, Doug, was uh, should you deadhead the knockout roses? And I would actually just say that about any rose for that matter. 
Well, um, they look a whole lot better. Mo most roses look a whole lot better if you deadhead them. And, um, you know, every gardener says, you should have seen my garden last week. Um, but I think the day of the tour was really a peak for the big spring flush of bloom on the roses and deading, deadheading them after that big flush of bloom um, is a big chore, but it's one we tend to do with all five interns and Tim and me all deadheading, so it goes quickly. And then deadheading is a continuum uh, chore the rest of the growing season, but it's never as big as after that first big sp spring blush. Um, the, the modern hybrid roses vary in their fertility. The ones that set fruit, and most don't, but if they set fruit uh, and you don't want, want the fruit, um, they will bloom more if you deadhead them. The ones that don't set fruit will continue to bloom if you don't deadhead them, but it really cleans them up nicely to deadhead them. It does. Well, thank you, Doug. Uh, Mary says that the uh, nematodes are a problem in the New Hanover County area. Um, Chris, aren't nematodes more of a problem on sandy soil? I sort of vaguely remember that from... I. Everyone that I've known that's had nematodes seems to be more in a sandy soil, but I don't really remember that being something that I've heard before. Mm. Like Bree has nematodes, but I think she is overall very sandy where she lives. Yeah, she probably is there. Um, you know, I, I don't know what to do about nematodes in established planting. There are cover crops that can be planted in an empty bed that go make a huge impact on um, nematodes. It's a winter cover crop. Mm -hmm. um, if you visited the Arboretum late winter, early spring, you might have seen it in bloom. It's actually a mustard. It's called Mighty Mustard. And you, you till it in before, you know, just as it's starting to bloom or a little bit earlier. And it cuts back on nematodes by over 80%. So it's, you know, almost as effective as a fumigant. And fumigants are good because they kill all the beneficials as well. And from from what I remember of back in my days of education, so we'll, we'll see how many decades ago that was, Doug. <laughs> um, I remember that there was kind of two classifications for nematodes, and there are some nematodes that once they go in a plant, they can't come back out of the plant. And those are the ones that work really good with the cover crops, because if you kill the cover crops, you kill the nematodes, and they can't complete their life cycle. But there are some nematodes that go in and out of the plant, so if you just kill the plant, they just move on to something else. So I remember there's two different kinds of classifications for them. Any add-ons, Doug, or Mark? I was just going to say the root knot nematodes are ones that, that get in there. That's why you don't come out. Those knots and cover crops can be quite helpful in those cases. Yep. I was also going to add on, you get a lot of them, you get more issues in sandy soils because they, they're built up in agricultural soils mm -hmm. and in when you're on clay, they've usually scraped off everything so far down um, so that they can build that they've scraped away a lot of that. And it would it takes a long time for them to build up, whereas in the sandy soils, they can move back in a lot quicker uh, than they can in the clay soil. So they can be in the clay soils. They're just often not built up in those big numbers and able to reinfest as quickly and move with waters as quickly um, as they in the clay soils. Thanks, Mark. We have uh, another one from Sandy, Doug, and uh, she was wondering if any of our roses outside of the rose garden itself got rose rosette and had to be removed. Yeah, it happens here or there. Um, and I I did, I did include the um, at least one of your conversations about uh, Rose Rosette in today's video. So we'll be covering that okay. in just a moment. I okay. think you overall talked about it twice and I think one of them didn't quite make the cut, final cut, <laughs> if you can say yeah. that. Um, uh, Pam, Pam is saying uh, what your favorite hybrid tea is. Um, I really don't have one. My only rose that I have at home is one called um, China Doll. It's a little old shrubby kind of rose. I don't know what its official classification is, but it's adorable. I love that one. And I mentioned earlier, I think that uh, Rad Treasure, the Tahitian Treasure, that's, that's a beautiful plant. I love that one. Doug, your favorite? Well, if you're talking about a true hybrid tea, nearly all hybrid teas are 
not worth growing unless you keep them coated in fungicides. So it's hard for me to love any of them. There are a few that have an amazing fragrance. Most don't. Um, there's two hybrid teas um, there's, that are very disease resistant. There's a real old one named Aloha. You know, 30, 40 years ago when I was gardening in Hillsborough, North Carolina, you would see Aloha in old gardens because it's so healthy, it doesn't die. Um, and then there's a I think it was bred by Buck, um, a hybrid tea or something that's very much like a hybrid tea that um, doesn't need to be sprayed and it's very fragrant. And it, it's called Quietness, Quietness. Um, it's probably hard to find, but um, I wouldn't know where to tell you to look for it, but you might be able to find it. Hey, great. And Sally, our guest all the way from Portland, Oregon, says that she used to get a lot of uh, grafted roses from a company in Canada because they were grown on very hardy rootstock and they did very well for her. But she noticed that her newer on their own root system plants don't seem to be as vigorous or hardy. And she was just looking to see if any comments based upon that. I know you talked about the Dr. Huey and that's usually the common rootstock and, and roses are grown on rootstocks because a lot of their own rootstocks aren't strong enough. Um, I suspect that the Canadian nursery was Pickering. Pickering it was yep. a great nursery. Um, I think they might still be in business, but it's been years ago they stopped shipping to the U.S., which was a real loss because their list was huge. And they've grafted on Multiflora rose rather than on Dr. Huey. Oh, wow. Is, I imagine that people have uh, cleaned the virus out of Dr. Huey, so it might be an okay rootstock. But all of the... Um, Except for the David Austin roses we looked at on this tour, all the others are on their own route. And, um, they're really vigorous growers. The drift roses, all of these, the elegant roses are on their own route and they're really strong growers. Of course, you know, maybe, you know, if you're a plant breeder and you're breeding for garden performance and you probably want them also to be strong growers on their own route so they can be propagated by stem cuttings rather than grafting. And that the Easy Elegance roses were bred in, I think I'm correct in saying Minnesota, some real cold part of the country. And if a rose was grafted and it died to the ground, it's the understock that would regrow. But if it's on its own root and it died to the ground, what regrew would be the rose that you want there, not the understock. Hey, great. Thank you, Doug. And um, we had someone ask, I think it's moved off the screen. Oh, uh, there it is. It's from Noel. She was just saying that she's lost a lot of her roses from thrips. And she was just wondering if you could talk about thrips at all for a little bit. And I don't believe you address thrips on the tour. So that might be a good one to talk about. Now, does she mean she lost the plants or just the flowers? I, uh, quoting her, she lost all of her rose or all of her tea roses to thrips. Yeah, well, when somebody says they're roses, I don't know whether they mean the cut flower. Maybe she can come in and say well, that one. I'm just uh, going to read it, but I know they're often in the flowers only. There's Noel. Doug, it was all the whole plant. The whole plant died. Never heard of that happening. I, I don't really have experience with um, thrips. Sure, it wasn't something other than thrips? No, I had it diagnosed. Oh, dear. Extra vigorous thrips, maybe. I don't know. I don't Jurassic know thrips for that. Yeah, those are usually only in the flowers, right, Doug? That's the only place I've ever heard of. Um, right. Uh, yeah, but right, on the flowers. You're right. Yeah, but what happened was once all the flowers were gone, the plant died. No, ma'am. Thrips don't kill a plant. Something else killed that rose. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would imagine the plant was stressed, which led to a out, a bad outbreak of thrips. You saw the thrips and the, the the flowers all died from the thrips and the plant, which was already under stress from something else, maybe root not nematodes, who knows, um, mm -hmm. went after that would be my guess. But it, it was diagnosed with thrips because it did have thrips, but that was probably a secondary um, infestation. Okay, thank oh, you. That's a really good point. 
And uh, we have a, a, a little last one here from Paul, of course, down in um, the Wilmington area. He was just commenting that he was very impressed by all the uh, Easy Elegance roses that he saw. He was up here for the plant sale, looked great at that time. That was um, no, no more than a full week before the Plant Lovers Tour actually took place. So it was a great time to visit. And he was just commenting that he hasn't seen them available for sale. I was just asking uh, if we had any comments for about availability. That's something we don't really keep track of ourselves. So it's been a while since I've looked for Rose at a garden center. I don't know if you have anything to add comment wise, Doug, and maybe someone in our audience can comment if they've seen them for sale. Um, I, I know I, I joke around a lot, but I, I really don't get out that much. I, I don't go to many garden centers. Um, having said that, yes, I haven't seen the Easy Elegance roses. I certainly haven't seen them in the big box retailers. I see the knockouts all the time. I see the drift roses all the time. Um, if you're not seeing them, I would just, if you deal with a local garden center, I would just talk to them and urge them to um, buy, uh, you know, it, buy them in so they can uh, have them for resale. They are bred by uh, Bailey's Nursery, which is strictly wholesale. Um, you know what? Go on the Bailey's Nursery website. They probably list uh, retail outlets for them because a lot of uh, businesses work that way when they're wholesale. They tell you where you can buy things retail. That's a good suggestion, but as Doug said, if your garden center doesn't have it, always ask. They have access to hundreds, if not thousands, of additional plants that they just don't normally carry. Yeah, they, they might, might also have. Great. Yeah, they might also know mail order sources for them yep. as well. Well, how about if we move on to the second video? Because that one took me far or took us far longer. We went from having yeah. no questions to having oodles of questions. So let's move on to tour stop number two. Here it comes. This rose is Dr. Huey. No one intentionally plants Dr. Huey. Dr. Huey for many, many decades, maybe longer than that, was used as the understock for grafting roses. Um, things that are easy to root from stem cuttings are generally rooted from stem cuttings, but some things that are harder to root are grafted. Fruit trees, peaches, apples, pears um, are grafted um, and another reason plants are grafted is because if you take a bud or a scion a, a, um, and graft it onto an existing root system, you can more quickly produce a saleable plant because it's starting off with a, the understocks developed root system. So grafting was the standard practice in rose production for a long, long time. And under Dr. Huey was used as the understock. I have no idea why they chose Dr. Huey. Maybe, maybe it's one that formed a good graft union quickly. Um, unfortunately, for a very long time, the, the Dr. Huey they used was virused. So if you graft a plant onto a virused understock, the top is gonna be virused. So if you have grafted plants and they have yellow mottled foliage, and I'm not seeing really any of this on this this morning, the top is going to be virus. Now there, I, I know that Dr. Huey is still being used as an understock by some growers because we have, you know, roses that were planted in the rose garden, you know, in the last 20 years or less that have Dr. Huey as an understock because it will occasionally throw up shoots from the crown of the plant. Um, but you can, re they remove the virus from roses by growing them in a growth chamber where they can get the growth as fast as possible. And then they take the very tip of the apical meristem, which is dividing just a little bit faster than the virus. And so if they take just the tip of that and grow, grow it from under, I mean, in tissue culture, um, they can produce, they can clean the virus out of a cultivar. They've done that with a number of old rose varieties that have been, you know, virused for, you know, maybe close to a century or so. But why do we have Dr. Huey here? Because before, uh, you know, this bed was, had many lives before it was a, um, 
the perennial border that exists today. And one one of the things that was planted to roses, I have a vague memory of that. And uh, when the roses were removed, a lot of the Dr. Hueys uh, regrew from what was left underground. Um, I've always despised this plant because, <laughs> well, it's not very pretty. And uh, now is a good time to talk about black spot. The main pathogen that you deal with when you're growing roses that are not disease resistant is black spot. And I think you can very clearly see where it gets its name. And um, looks familiar. Yeah. And there are chemicals which will control black spot, but they only work on a preventative basis which means you have to keep this foliage co coated in fungicide. And so this leaf that already has black spot, uh, spraying with fungicide is not gonna save this leaf that it can only protect the leaves that are still free of black spot. And so because you have to keep the foliage um, coated with fungicide, you, you know, I'm not up to date on the uh, rose fungicides because I no longer work in a rose garden where we grow roses that get black spot with a few exceptions. Um, but you know, to, the chemicals I'm familiar with, you spray it every seven to 10 days and after every rain. So, you know, if you're religious about keeping those uh, roses sprayed, um, you can keep the foliage clean. If you don't keep the foliage clean, the uh, a lot of the hybrid teas and similar roses that are so susceptible to black spot will largely be leafless. And you imagine a plant without leaves is not going to be a very, it won't be a thriving plant that produces a lot of flowers. So, you know, the fact that we, you know, we already saw two phenomenal examples of modern roses that were bred with a, you know, first and foremost, their focus was on disease resistance. Um, you know, you, you can un understand why, why I feel like it's a really good time to grow roses because you can select so many beautiful things. And we'll see a lot more as we go through the garden. I didn't realize uh, that I'd be starting off with three um, roses by the same breeder. Maybe he's listening. Uh, maybe he'll see the uh, rebroadcast in uh, the end of the month. But this is the same breeder as the first two roses. You see RAD again, Rad Sun, Carefree Sunshine. You can see why he wouldn't have included this in the knockout series, because it's a very much larger growing shrub than uh, the knockouts, which you know maybe get about five feet tall or so. But is that one bush? That is one very large bush. And uh, I, I think the label that came with it didn't indicate that it was going to get anywhere near this big. There is another series of roses that were bred for disease resistant. And I see a tiny bit of a black spot on this, but um, um, well, I'll get back to the black spot in um, a second. Uh, the series is Drift, Drift Roses, and there's a, oh, maybe almost a dozen different selections in the Drift Roses. Oh, there's its label. Um, yeah, it's Apricot Drift, which is what I was thinking it was. But again, ap apricot, apricot Drift is the, re in this case, it's the registered name. I don't know the difference between a trademark name and a registered name. The um, cultivar name is Mima Rot, M-E-I-M, I R R O T. I think that M E I might be referred to the House of Midland, a French rose breeding nursery. But the drift roses are low growing. This is typical height or even a little bit lower. Uh, good repeat bloom all summer. Um, the little bit of black spot I see sometimes after their, some roses after their first flush of bloom will have a little bit of black spot, but then be clean the rest of the year. Um, but the Drift Roses are a really good series of roses, especially if you need something that doesn't get terribly large, because we're going to see a bunch of roses in the rose garden that are quite large growing things, which are, you know, fine if you have the room for it.
All righty. That was a, another round of learning about some great roses here at the Arboretum. Thank you, Doug, for doing that earlier. And I don't see any new questions for these roses. Um, so if anyone has a question, go ahead and unmute yourself. We'd love to hear from you. And of course, you can type the question into the chat as well. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next tour stop. Any additional comments about those, Doug, that you want to add? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Well, how about if we move on to tour stop number three? Um, here we go. Um, Mary has asked, do you prune drift roses? Um, that's a really important question, and I'm glad to have it. And the main point I want to make is if, if people know anything about pruning roses, they know how to prune a hybrid tea rose. But that type of pruning is specific to hybrid tea roses. Um, hybrid tea roses have a very bad growth habit. They tend to make a very limited number of very tall stems. And so they are regularly cut back hard. Um, you know, they're cut back hard before spring and then each time, um, of, of, you know, they're either deadheaded or the flowers are cut for indoor use. Um, they're cut back fairly hard again. And that way they will, instead of having one stem or a limited number of stems, they'll have a few more stems and they'll be somewhat shorter. But all of these shrub roses and certainly climbing roses do not get pruned like a hybrid tea. They benefit from the yearly renewal pruning of many other flowering shrubs like spireas or forsythia, and that you can go in each year and cut out up to about a third of the oldest stems. And if you don't do that, then after a bunch of years, you have a whole lot of really old decrepit wood um, and at that point, and we did this in the uh, rose garden to a few drift roses, we just cut the whole thing to the ground to let it start over from the ground. Um, but if we had been keeping up with it each year, um, we wouldn't have gotten to the point where it was made more sense just to start over uh, entirely new. Now, I, I do, I'm not backing off from my point that um, Shrub roses do not need the hard pruning that a hybrid tea does. Um, but because these roses that bloom all summer long bloom on new wood, but they're probably blooming on both old wood in the spring and the new wood all summer. If you cut them back hard in the winter, they're still going to bloom well that same summer. Uh, so they will tolerate it, but they do not need it. Now, if you have a smaller garden and you want to grow some of these large growing roses, you can cut them back harder to re re restrain their size. But you know, if you have the room, some of the big growing roses in the Easy Elegant series really make these big, beautiful masses. Um, I see a question, do you have to prune drift roses? Again, the same point of each year on established plants in the it could be any time, but winter is an easy time when they're leafless. Just prune out up to about a third of the oldest stems, and that'll promote the greater production of new wood, which will bloom much better than old wood. Great. I think that takes care of all of those questions. Let's move on to the tour stop number three video. Might be a, a good point to talk about the history of roses. Um, you know, Europeans have grown roses for centuries. Um, you know, the, the War of the Roses, when, when was that, the 1500s? Um, you know, the, between the House of York and the House of Tudor, one selected the white rose of, uh, I'm no historian, but there was the white rose and the red rose selected by the two different houses that were battling each other. Um, the uh, European roses are generally once blooming. Uh, so you have the, and in, in England, they refer to them as June roses, I guess. But in our climate, we're so warm and warm so early that, um, you know, by June, the roses have already been blooming for close to two months. Um, 
And then roses have also been cultivated for centuries, probably many centuries in Asia. Um, and um, in um, the uh, cultivated roses in uh, Asia fall into two very related, maybe even the same classes, but called teas and chinas. And um, teas, the tea roses of China are, the full name is actually tea scented roses, because mm. to some noses, some of those roses smell like tea. Now that's, I drink a lot of tea and I buy good tea and there's some rose, some teas that smell like roses. So I don't, you know, kind of curious. Um, and the hybrid teas, um, it's really important to not drop the hybrid part of hybrid tea because a hybrid tea is not the same um, as a tea rose. Um, the hybrid teas are, you know, as it's like calling a, uh, a, a you know, it's like not dis distinguishing between a mule and its horse and donkey parent. The hybrid tea is a hy hybrid with the tea roses as one of the parents. With the introduction of the tea roses and the china roses from Asia, you get repeat blooming. You also get the typical tall pointed bud of a, of a tea rose. You know, that is the shape that we uh, associate with cut roses, with the long stem roses. Um, but, and, and hybrid tea roses are not new. The earliest cultivar, La France, was I meant to look up the actual year, but I know it was in the 1800s when La France was introduced. So people have been breeding hybrid tea roses for a long time. Um, if, if you go back one step further back, uh, an earlier hybrid between the European and Asian roses were a group of roses known as um, hybrid perpetuals. They tend to have very long, lax canes, and if they're not pegged, they tend to just produce a few flowers at the tip of the shoot. But if you bend the stems over, they tend to make a lot of side shoots and have a lot more flowers. But when you breed a hybrid tea, a na no, I'm sorry, a hybrid perpetual rose with a tea rose, you end up with the hybrid teas, and the hybrid teas, um, you know, tend to have this very tall, unbranched stems, and that's why they get cut back hard every time you deadhead them, and then when you do the winter pruning. But that hard cutback that is typical of pruning hybrid teas is only practiced on hybrid teas, and they're closely related grandifloras and floribundas. Uh, so don't, if you're growing roses and they're not hybrid teas, don't, don't prune them back hard. They will tolerate, tolerate being pruned back hard, but the, it's not what they need. Uh, instead, just go in every year and take out up to about a third of the oldest wood uh, that is no longer productive, and that will promote the uh, e even greater production of um, uh, new wood, which will be productive. So this is a, a tea rose, not a hybrid tea. And you see the flowers are a lot like a hybrid tea rose, but they're smaller. A lot of the tea roses have um, sort of weak necks. So the flowers are often somewhat pendulous like you see on those down there, which is actually a, a nice feature when, when, you want, when you have a climbing form of it, because when it's overhead, the flowers sort of nod down and you look up in them. But, um, you know, by breeding the hybrid tea, um, you know, it, it became a really important cut flower crop. You think of the billions of dollars that are spent on long stem roses every Valentine's Day. Um, but breed, the breeders didn't pay any attention to uh, disease resistance, um, you know, at, Hybrid teas, as I mentioned, were first bred in the 1800s, but I don't know, I, I was wondering in thinking about today's presentation if part of the reason why no one focused on disease resistance in hybrid teas was, 
after World War II, it was better living through chemistry. And so it didn't matter if your rose had to be sprayed for fungicide continuously because we had the chemicals to do it. Um, frankly, I don't, I'm happier to use fewer chemicals than more in the garden, you know, and, uh, you know, this time of year, walking my dog at night, I, I don't enjoy walking a path past uh, lawns that have been treated with 2,4-D because it's an unpleasant smell and probably not a very healthful thing to be breathing in. And, you know, I don't want to be using chemicals in the garden. So the, the uh, rose garden here, the Finley Nottingham Rose Garden, um, l largely features roses that can be grown uh, without spraying. We don't do any spraying. Um, because we can grow things like this huge red thing, red rose there, um, without any fungicide spraying. And I took care of a rose garden for 10 years and I've never found insects to be a big problem on roses. Um, many springs, initially aphids will show up, but if you just wait a week or so, the insects that eat it, um, aphids will show up and take uh, control of them. And, Usually that's the last I would ever see insects on roses in the rose garden. Um, Japanese beetles uh, used to be a bigger problem than they are now. Sometimes when we have these newly introduced pests, eventually uh, natural en enemies of them, whether they're pathogens or other insects or other animals, catch up with them and they're no longer the problem they were originally. Um, but when I was taking care of that rose garden for a decade in Hillsboro, uh, it was sort of the peak period of Japanese beetles. And they didn't def hurt mo most of the foliage. They primarily ate the flowers. So by midsummer or so, they'd be gone. And then the roses would bloom nicely the rest of the summer. Another thing I should say about the tea roses, not the hybrid tea roses, is that they're really good for our climate. But if you're gardening in colder parts, uh, the the tea roses generally are only good in the warmer end of zone seven and uh, um, further south. Um, there's almost a subtropical group of, of roses. This particular one is called Spice. It's a rose that... Um, this wonderful uh, rosarian from uh, South Carolina found in Bermuda, uh, Ruth Knopf. She's a, a good friend of mine. Unfortunately, Ruth has been uh, in a nursing home for a few years now. Um, and just yesterday, a, a friend of mine who's a volunteer here sent me a, a photo of Ruth because uh, she had gone to visit her this week. But um you know, it's one of our best tea roses, and we do actually don't have a large number of tea roses, um, and probably even fewer hybrid tea roses. We we do freely remove roses that are new to the garden that prove to be too uh, black spot susceptible. Um, so some roses aren't here for terribly long, but the better ones are um, are you know, long term, the, usually the, nowadays, the main reason why we um, remove a rose is if it gets rose rosette disease. Now, is everyone familiar with rose rosette? Um, it's caused by a pathogen that's a, um, I don't think they have even fully figured out what the pathogen is. It is spread by tiny mites. Um, I'm going to try to pronounce the name of the group of mites that this mite belongs to. Eriophorid mites. I think it's E-R-I-O-P-H-I-D. They're tiny mites that are so small that they do, um, and wingless, I think, that they get around on a breeze. No breeze like this would transport them far and wide. Um, but they they are the uh, vector of the pathogen that causes rose rosette. Um, in rose rosette, um, you end up with what in 
other situations referred to as a witch's broom, where instead of one branch, it'll be many, many, many small branches all clustered together. And usually the, that growth is bright red. Now I do have to add that a lot of roses, especially roses with red or pink flowers, the new growth is red and that's nothing to worry about. It's when it's highly branched in these dense little clumps. Now I don't, we try to keep, uh, um, we, you know, inspect the roses frequently and uh, deal with the rose rosette frequently. I mean, not, not frequently, but um, quickly. Um, there is no treatment for it other than removal of the plant. Um, the experts say you can replant a rose in the location where you remove the rose. Um, and one uh, person who was the um, director, horticulture director of a major garden in the Northeast said that in their rose garden, they will, the first time a plant shows rose rosette, they will cut out that stem and watch the plant. But if it comes back after that, they will remove the plant. And, and we do remove them um, when we see rose rosette. So, um, you know, obviously some of these bigger plants have escaped rose rosette for quite a few years, but where you see we have um, smaller plants, they're ones that were planted about a year ago. Um, so, and you know, the, probably a, a pro, an issue that makes controlling rose rosette a bit more difficult is when you see, it's probably more often, often a commercial planting where they have big masses of roses, often knockout roses, where they're extremely highly infested with rose rosette. So that could be a source of infection as uh, the mites feed on them and then end up getting transported, uh, you know, to some, at that point, un, um, uninfected roses. So, you know, if you have any sway in a commercial landscape to urge them to remove their infected roses, it would probably benefit everybody. I was muted. We had a lot of people out here. Um, so there's a lot of talk about Rose Rosette. If you're not a chat follower, I included a photograph that you can see in one of the links. So you can see what Rose Rosette looks like if you're not familiar with it. And Mark also added a comment in that you should remove the roots of plants that are infected that you've removed um, to make sure that you don't have Rose Rosette in the same area. Yeah, and that, was, came yeah, on. that was on, on the heels of Doug saying, you know, replanting. The experts say you can replant in the same spot within just a few days, um, you know, within a week. That's you, you're supposed to not just cut it off at ground level. You got to pull the roots out. And since roses have not much in the way of a root system, typically it's pretty easy. Okay, great. So uh, I have a question here, Doug, it looks like. Um, did Doug say that knockout roses are especially susceptible to rose rosettes? No, I did not. I don't believe I did. And okay. I've not. I've heard people suggest that. I don't know if there's any truth to it. It's just that they're so heavily planted and often in huge masses that I think it's just where people first see rose rosette. And they're often planted heavily in commercial landscapes where there's not any knowledgeable horticultural care of them. And so they tend to stay there year after year after year getting worse and worse. Yeah, I, just to jump on that, exactly what you said, the, the reason I think that they have gotten a rap for, for being highly susceptible and sometimes for being the source of it, these mites um, have been around. Uh, the, the issue is most cultivated roses were in rose gardens scattered here and there, especially in modern times where there weren't like everybody isn't planting roses in their yards and the knockout roses were such phenomenal landscape shrubs that they were planted in lots of people's gardens. And as Doug says, in these massive commercial uh, settings. And so these mites, which move on the wind and have to land on a host that they can, they can in fact, all of a sudden, they had all these spots to move from one plant to the next plant to the next plant 
and proliferate and be, have more and more and more of them there. And so it was really just all those shrub, all those knockout roses in the landscapes that allowed them to move so thoroughly through the landscapes. When they were roses were more separated, they just weren't a, a big issue. They could still show up, but they weren't a problem. Great. Excellent. Well, it looks like no more questions. How about if we move on to the uh, fourth video, everyone? Let me go ahead and get that one loaded. And here we go. Um, another group of roses are the uh, English Heritage Series. They're bred by David Austin. And this almost white one back here, you can stay there, I'll just grab the tag. You know, a, a same situation where we have a cultivar name and a trademark name. Um, and all of the David Austin roses start with AUS for Austin. And it's a real mixed lot of things because some of them are extremely susceptible to black spot. There's a, a really incredibly fragrant one named for Gertrude Jekyll. Um, that is a martyr to black spot. You know, the leaves look as bad as the leaf I pulled off of the Dr. Huey. But um, there are some um, David Austin roses, English heritage roses that have remained um, um, in, in this rose garden because they are adequately resistant to black spot and good performers. And this is one. Um, uh, and you see the trade, I mean, the cult of trademark name is Crocus Rose, odd name. But, uh, you know, David Austin's an Englishman breeding in England. So there are a lot of them, you know, like uh, commemorating the royal family and stuff. I think we have a Queen Elizabeth, not Queen Elizabeth, but some member of the royal family over there. And if you turn around the big pale yellow rose on the arbor, is a David Austin rose that's Malvern Hills. Um, it's a real pretty thing and quite quite a good repeater. Um, in, I think it was the winter 2017, 2018, when we were cold for three weeks, that rose died back some. So, um, you know, it's a good rose for a warm climate, but if you were gardening in a colder part of the country, I wouldn't recommend Malvern Hills. This is a really good performer. It's, um, here's the MEI that I think is the Midland House, or the Midland Nursery. Maima Kota, the grand champion. It's, um, yeah, again, planted in 2016. Um, just really good performer. And clean and you know it's it is a smaller growing bro rose in the back I this is um, one of my favorite roses it's an ancient rose um, with the single flowers that's Rosa mutabilis what does mutabilis sound like yeah exactly to uh, mutate and the flowers open the flowers open yellowish and then turn pinkish and then uh, almost, almost well, a dark pink, not really red. And um, it will bloom all summer. Some people have the common name of, uh, use the common name of butterfly rose for it. Um, but it's, and the plant will get twice that size. We cut it back hard last year. Um, and you will see a lot of roses, like the yellow one across the way, we, the flowers open dark and, and fade. Um, I don't know for sure. I, probably if I did a little research, I'd find some ecologist confirm my suspicion that a lot of flowers change color um, in order to indicate to pollinators that this is the flower you should visit, not this one that's already two days old but I'm not gonna shed that flower that's two days old because all of them are acting like eat at Sam's restaurant neon sign. Um, and you, there are a lot of plants that change colors. You think of lantana. They're not really bicolor flowers. They're the individual florets go through a series of color changes. And I really think, um, you know, that 
you you want the pollinator efforts to not be in vain because the purpose of a flower is reproduction. You know, the purpose of the flower is to produce um, um, seed, which is you know how how plants are reproduced, or the main way that flowering plants are reproduced is by seed. Um, so it's not uncommon to see roses that go through these color changes. Um, and that, that, you know, talk, talking about pollination, it might bring up the issue of um, planting things to support pollinators. None of the roses we've seen this morning are good uh, plants for pollinators. Even um, single flowered ones, if that was, I do see a hum, I mean, hummingbird. A, what do they call uh, honeybee? Honeybee on, on that, but if that was a true wild rose with single flowers, you'd see our little bumblebees racing around that boss of stamens in the center. It's really fun to see. But um, normally, uh, often when a flower becomes double, because a wild rose just has five petals, um, it's the reproductive parts that become the additional petals. And so there's nothing left for the bee to, uh, you know, there's no nectar left, there's no pollen left. And um, often even uh -huh. a single rose that's, you know, the result of generations of hybridizing might look like something that would support pollinators. And it looks like it has sta normal stamens, but they're not normal stamens in the center. Um, so, um, you know, don't count on your roses to support um, um, pollinators. But one of the topics today was also um, plants to combine with roses. And so the, the non-rose plants you add to your rose garden, if you're going to have a rose garden, can be the things that support pollinators. And there are a number of good things in here. But um, when I worked in that rose garden for 10 years, the very proper owner of the garden said to me when I was started including things like sweet williams and um, larkspur and other things to bloom with the once blooming roses, she said, it has always been the policy to have just roses with roses. And I think that goes back to Gertrude Jekyll. <laughs> Gertrude Jekyll is the mother of the perennial border, which is you know, this incredible combination of plants. But she also wrote a book on roses. And I think generally she just, for the most plant part, just planted roses with roses. But you know, it, there's absolutely no reason why roses have to stay in a rose garden. Um, you know, select the ones you use and mix them in with um, with other things. When when I'm thinking about what to combine with roses, um, I think of you know the the color range of roses. It's uh, you know white, pink, red, yellow, orange, purple, and so I think well let's combine something that's a different color than the roses. We have a little bit of Campanula glomerata on the edge, a little can, uh, campanula um, that is a, a violet colored, um, a nice contrast to the colors of the roses. I also think of the shapes of roses. They're mostly little round heads, you know, whether it's a flat top typical of a European ro rose or the pointed bud of uh, the tea roses. Um, they're basically little round flowers. Um, so I, I like to use plants that are a different shape. Not evident today because it doesn't start blooming for another month or so. Um, we have a, a blue flowered salvia in here, salvia pallida. Uh, so it's blue, which is a color that, you know, plenty of nursery will sell you a blue rose, but it's not gonna be close to blue, it's gonna be maybe um, no, no more blue than the campanula is. Um, so the, the blue flowers of the um, salvia are a nice contrast to the color of the roses, but also those flowers and spikes are a nice contrast to all the little round heads of, of roses. And that particular salvia, salvia pallida, meaning pale, um, 
Oh, it blooms all summer up and, and into the fall until we have a hard frost and it's highly favored by b uh, bumblebees. Now it does spread, um, not rampantly, but steadily. So most years we have to rein it in so it doesn't swamp its neighbors. Um, but there are other salvias that are clump formers, like some of the uh, forms of the mealy cup sage, salvia farinacea, um, which would give you the same spikes. And this little plant that doesn't look particularly exciting today is a dwarf chaste tree, Vitex agnus castus. It's one that um, Arboretum uh, supporter Bobby Wilder found. That's as tall as it's ever gotten. You know, three foot is about waist height on me, so that's more closer to being about 30 inches tall, not even three feet tall. Some of them get really big, though. Yeah, it's some of them get really big. There's one outside the rose garden that is still a baby and Blooms nine feet tall. Kind of yeah, so the blue violet spikes the flowers most of the summer and a really good uh, plant for pollinators. But, you know, you can buy, combine anything um, you want with the roses. Um, some of the smaller clematis would uh, clamber nicely through the bigger shrub roses. Uh, you gotta, it's sort of like a marriage, you have to match them up properly so the clematis isn't so robust that it um, swamps the rose. Um, there is an interesting clematis in here. Um, I don't know if you see that purplish foliage. Mm -hmm. That is a clematis. Not all clematis are vines. It's um, it's sort of bushy. It it's it's good amongst the roses because it's kind of sprawly, but it doesn't climb. It'll just lean into its neighbors. It's uh, clematis recta. Um, the cultivar is lime close. An English word. I don't know what close is in English vernacular. I don't know. Is that like a walled garden or something? It's probably the name of a garden, a lime close. Uh, it's so probably it the name of a garden. Um, it has small white flowers in mm -hmm. summer. Um, this cultivar is probably more interesting to grow than the green leaf form because you do have the purple foliage this time of year. That takes care of that video. That was our fourth one out of six. We are getting a little bit late, but I'm happy to keep on going with the other videos. Maybe we can play the last one just as the concluding um, uh, part and just let people hang out if they wanted to. But I did see a couple of questions in here, Doug, that I thought would be good. The first one was from Paul. If pollinators aren't fertilizing the flowers, how do you explain the rose hips? Good question. I guess the ones that form rose hips. Well, I don't know. Maybe they are self-pollinating. Some some plants are self-pollinating. I think um, aren't tomato plants largely self-pollinating, or peppers and such? Well, I worked in the greenhouse and we pollinated them by hand using electric. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I remember those pictures of yeah. you in the bumblebee suit. Yes, yes. So <laughs> I. I well, I, I guess there are, yeah, I'm sure there's exceptions to what I said. But they, I mean, they, they use their own pollen. We just had to knock it free. We were, we were yeah. filling the purpose of a bee because there was not, none of them in the greenhouse. The name of the black, uh, excuse me, the clematis that is not a vine. What was that again, please? Clematis recta, R-E-C-T-A. The cultivar is lime close, C-L-O-S-E. Lime is the English common name for linden trees, I believe. Thank you. And Nancy is asking for the name of the Vitex again. I don't think it has an official name. It was just probably Bobby's Dwarf, isn't it? Yeah, Bobby's or Bobby Wilder's Dwarf. It's um, when a couple of plant breeders were here a couple of weeks ago, I er, urged them to consider working with it because it's amazingly dwarf. So that'd be a fun example of a plant that's very unique to the Arboretum, that if it had enough cuttings and you did our propagation workshop, plug, 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 that you can propagate your own. And that'd be a good way to get it. This is, uh, John, this is Joan in Michigan. Hey, we, Joan. We, we, hello. We get, uh, our, of course, our blooms are in June mostly, and we immediately get Japanese beetles. Do you have that problem where you are? Um, well, you know, 40 years ago when I'm, uh, was working in that rose garden 
Japanese beetles were a huge problem for the first half of summer. Um, in recent years, and I hope that Chris or Mark could chime in and either agree or disagree with me, I see very few Japanese beetles in the summer. When I moved here in 1993, uh, the previous homeowner had two or three roses in the front yard and they were covered in Japanese beetles and I just didn't feel like battling it. So they were the first plant I removed. But um, uh, I don't have a lot of Japanese beetles in my yard. I don't know if it was because, but, or because of it, but I did use the traps. I have a yard where they worked effectively. I have no one behind us and the wind blows in the right direction. And I was able to put them out in the front yard and those bags were filled continuously and I just depleted the population and they weren't mating and laying eggs and haven't really had a problem since I find two or three or just a small handful every year. And that's it. We've, we found at Meadowbrook Hall, which is the Dodge estate in Rochester, Michigan, that if we put the traps out, we got twice as many. So uh, anyone who has them in their gardens here, they encourage you to get out before noon because noon they can fly. So if you go out there first thing in the morning with your sudsy water and you just yep. flick them, they fall in the water. That's the only way we can. Or there is a Bayer treatment that I've used. I don't know what it is, like in March, to put in, in the roots systemically. And that seems to uh, keep them away, too. Yeah, that, that might be also keeping away any pollinators that are also going at the, after the plant. It could be making the whole plant systemically um, poisonous to any insect. Oh, that's good to know, too. OK, thank you. Know, you. Um, I, there was a bear product that had merit in it, which is a very effective uh, insecticide. But I think it stays um, lasting for at least six weeks, maybe upwards of two months. Was there a comment you had, Mark? I see you coming in. Um, yeah, I was I was just going to say, you know, kind of the same thing. I think that um, uh, that Doug had said and that you'd said that, you know, it's really you're more effective controlling you know grubs around and perf and areas like that and um but yeah they used to be a terrible problem and aren't nearly so much of a problem as, yeah. as they uh they used to be um i always thought there if you throw some four o'clocks in your rose garden those help reduce the numbers because they're toxic to japanese beetles yeah, in, in my yard in the early 90s, if I hit the trunk on a crepe myrtle, it just kind of erupted in Japanese beetles and had a particular maple in the front yard and they skeletonized it in a matter of like two days. <laughs> so it, it was a bad, a bad problem, but I think it's uh, gone away uh, significantly. So there was a comment to keep on going with the video. So how about if we two do um, stop number five, everyone? I, I probably didn't destroy the display in the rose garden by cutting a single flower, but um, you know, this this form with the very complicated arrangement of petals inside is very typical of the old European roses. In in the old European roses, you don't have that pointed bud of the of the tea roses. And um, you know, the David Austin is breeding mostly for um sort of modern versions of the old European roses. I'm sure that's why he calls them heritage roses, as opposed to breeding hybrid teas. This is an old found rose, in meaning that um, it's something somebody found um, in, in a garden and nobody knows its origin, but it's a really tough old plant. This is... Um, only at second spring, I think in time, we'll be able to train it across the arbor. It's, it's quite uh, vigorous. It's one named uh, Peggy Martin. Uh, we acquired it from a nursery, um, uh, Heritage Roses in Brenham, Texas. Um, they're a mail order nursery. Uh, their focus is on um, historic roses, heirloom roses, um, and, you know, some modern things, but um, things that can be grown without spraying. Um, this is its pika bloom. It will have some repeat bloom, but um, probably when this first flush is done, I'll prune out some of the stems that it's bloomed on. Um, and, you know, this time of year, it'll start putting out great big shoots. See, there's new, new flower buds coming on that aren't even close to blooming. So a long period of bloom. There's an old rose, Dr. Van Fleet. 
huge stiff stiff canes we used to well i'm getting ahead of myself um and dr van fleet had it just covered itself with flowers this time of year and then that was the end of the display at some point it, it sported sport is a sort of vernacular name for a mutation um, a lot of variegated plants occur as sports it's where a, a branch sport would be a stem on a plant that's different from the rest of the plant you know if, if this well, and it, it can be, you know, that this stem suddenly has variegated foliage. It's mutated in, in that stem of the plant. Or um, this stem has double flowers, or, and I've, um, or this stem has white flowers instead of... Those kinds of mutations happen. The mutation that happened in Dr. Van Fleet is that at some point somebody realized that part of the plant was repeat blooming so it would have the same big flush of bloom in this time of year but then it would bloom quite heavily so people rarely grow dr van fleet because new dawn is the same rose except with the repeat blooming habit um coral dawn i don't think is a direct relative of uh new dawn it probably just got its name because it's sort of similar in growth habit and fairly nice um growth I mean, uh, fairly clean foliage, um, but it, it's it's never gotten much size to it. Well, Ronnie, that one was a pretty short video. It doesn't look like anyone has any questions in the chat yet. If anyone has a question, of course, unmute yourself, ask it right now, or go ahead and ask it in the chat. Otherwise, we can move on to the other video. I forgot that one was a nice short one. I think the next one is kind of a medium length video and has a, a, a nice discussion about roses overall in addition to showing off some of the larger roses that we have. Okay, how about if we move on to that one? Here it comes, or at least I'll try to hunt it down. I'm going to, we'll see, nice uh, dose of black spot on that. And if you see the label, it's um, Dorient is the cultivar name. It's Mel Melody Radiance. I don't know anything about um, its origin. It has a fairly good fragrance. But if you see, pass that around. Um, the label indicates it's a Grandiflora rose. Well, Grandiflora is, it sort of goes back to what I said earlier about mutt dogs and that you know this one looks like a german shepherd and that one looks like a beagle um well when you when you're breeding some for like hybrid teas well hybrid teas tend to have a single flower on a tall stem you know long stem roses grandifloras are are fairly similar but they tend to have several flowers on a long stem and then floribundas are the third class of roses that are sort of part of that alliance of three classes. Um, Floribundas tend to be smaller growing plants that are more highly branched and have clusters of small flowers at the tip of each stem. Um, but, you know, in, in that class, in the hybrid teeth Floribunda grandiflora classes, you do occasionally come across one that um, is not susceptible uh, to black spot. There's an old hybrid tea that is, um, you know, has glorious, neat, clean foliage um, with the name of Aloha that um, when I was working in that rose garden, you'd occasionally see here and there in uh, gardens in Hillsborough or out in the country. Um, you know, it's tough as all get out clean foliage and um, despite being a hybrid tea. So it's not that you couldn't breed hybrid teas with disease resistant um, foliage um, if somebody wanted to and maybe somebody is. But I, I think in the other shortcoming of a hybrid tea is um, their, that growth habit, the tall unbranched stems, that's better for the cut flower industry or for the person growing cut flowers for their home than for garden display. You know, a hybrid tea with flowers like this 
Easy Elegance cashmere would be, you know, three to five upright stems, maybe taller than a person, flowers way up high, but you know, you can cut a 18 inch or two foot long stem on those. Um, but these more highly branched full shrubs, I think make a much better garden display than the typical hybrid tea growth habit. Roses want sun. Um, the Rose Garden, this location is sun all day. Certainly if we walk out that path, there's, I can see from here that those roses are still in the shade, but will be in the sun all afternoon. So it certainly does not need to be a location that's sun all day. Um, roses are, you know, basically really tough plants. You know, they they don't have to be pampered. They don't have to need Garden of Eden soil. Just normal drainage, you know, get your soil tested, cur do whatever the soil test tells you to do. You know, add lime if it's called for, fertilizer if it's called for. Um, I know, I don't know if the recommendations remain, remain the same, but you know, the, the recommendations in the past were like, you know, fertilize them every other hour, uh, you know, five pounds per square inch, you know, get your soil tested once you, we don't, I fertilized the rose garden this uh, winter, or probably late spring, early spring. Um, but we don't fertilize the garden on a regular basis. Do you think that plant needs fertilizer? We almost need to put something on it to slow its growth. It's so strong growing. So, um, you, you know. So you don't fertilize like that one? You don't I, not, I've, I've been in this job since October, 2017. We haven't applied fertilizer to most of the Arboretum. Really? Hmm. Um, you know, and on a clay soil, phosphorus and potassium are bound to the clay so they're not lost. They sort of end up being slow release because it's held in the soil by the clay. So, um, you know, we don't need to fertilize things on a regular basis. You know, observe your plants. If you think their growth looks adequate, then I wouldn't bother doing anything fertilizer or lime. If they're not doing well, well then get the soil tested. Moisture. Average moisture. Uh, roses, most roses don't want a soggy spot, certainly. You know, I, I'm not saying good drainage, I'm just saying normal drainage, a spot where water doesn't stand after a big rain. Um, there are a few wild roses, like the swamp rose, that will take wet, but not your average rose, just average moisture. And despite having thorns, um, deer do eat roses. Um, you know, I heard a sales clerk in the garden center telling a customer, well, deer won't eat roses, they have thorns. No, that doesn't stop them at all. Um, and frankly, I've also heard people say roses don't have any way to climb. Well, look at the thorns on a rose. They're not so much thorns as they are grappling hooks. If a, vine, if a rose has long stems, and they're flailing about in the wind and this other arm is a tree branch and they end over it, those hooks are like grappling hooks are gonna hold on to them. Much like Eliagnus pungens doesn't have thorns but it has those little downward spurs that act as a grappling hook. So I think thorns on a rose might give it a little bit of protection but I think they're primarily for climbing. You know, I wish thorns protected them, but they don't. More than you ever wanted to know about roses. <laughs> I thought that was a little neat ending uh, uh, sound bite that you had on the video tour. That does take care of all of the videos that Doug had. Um, several of them did wind up on the cutting room floor, and it wasn't because Doug didn't have any uh, good advice and good knowledge to share. It was just that I knew that we'd be short on time, and here we are past an hour and a half, so it's longer than I anticipated, but we still have a good number of people hanging out. So how about if we have some questions, Doug? Is that okay? That's fine. There's a number of questions in the chat. Yep, yep. I was going to try to hunt them down and just see where it was. Um, Sally was wondering, what was the name of that red rose that was behind you, Doug? I just happened to forget what it was. Um, 
Well, I know a few minutes earlier we were in the rose garden and I pointed out the easy elegance cashmere. Um, I think this is the big red one that was near the green barn and the bees and stuff. No, 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 Chris, I'm going there. I'm going there. I don't remember if the one out that uh, outside the rose garden where I blabbered for a long time. I don't remember. That is another one of the easy elegance. It might also be cashmere. I just don't remember. You can look it up in the file maker, Chris. And Sally, you can also look it up for yourself. Just type in easy elegance in our search feature on our plant records and you'll get all of them and look for the ones with red flowers. Yeah, we um, ended up not seeing many of the easy elegance in this video. Uh, we saw more on the tour, but I think if you just, I know just go online and look up easy elegance roses and you'll be able to view uh, pictures of all of them. I did try to include a mix of the different roses that you covered. It does seem like I covered more of the um, rad ones than the other ones, though. So mm -hmm. um, Barbara says that she was um, uh, would like to know a little bit more about growing roses for hips display. Can you add any information on that one? I believe I uh, got rid of the part about Rosa Rugosa. Yeah, Rosa Rugosa. Um, especially the single flowered forms of it. It's an easy rose to uh, grow because it um, doesn't uh, develop black spot. Um, make a, uh, a good sized fruit. One of its common names is seed tomato because the fruit is about the size of a tomato um, and they're produced all summer long. Um, they are edible. I only eat the rind and not the hard seeds inside, but it's not a winter display because the fruit shrivels with freezing weather. One of my favorite roses for fruit display are, well, not one, but several of my favorites are uh, some of our native shrub roses like Rosa Virginiana or Rosa Caroliniana. Um, they have a fruit display that it persists all winter. Both of them are suckering shrubs, so they're not for a small garden because they will make big, broad um, colonies. But if you have a, you know, enough room for them, they're a lovely winter display of fruit. There are a number of roses that are common um, where they can be grown. Um, I'm not going to think of their names right now, but there's a number of roses that are grown more for their fruit display than their floral display, but they're um, mostly ones that I haven't succeeded with in our climate. They're probably more cold weather roses. I had to mute, big catering order was coming in. Uh, thank you, Doug. Uh, Kiki was commenting that she is uh, that she lost her 50-year-old Dr. Van Fleet rose, which is very sad news indeed. I uh, got succumbed to um, Rose Rosette. And she's looking at maybe replacing it with the new Dawn. I was just wondering if that one's any more susceptible, less susceptible, equal. I haven't heard of any rose that's necessarily resistant to it myself. No, I, I don't. I'm not aware of any roses that are resistant to it. Um, new Dawn is merely a um, sport of Dr. Van Fleet. So, you know, other than mutating to being a repeat bloomer, I should think it's just as susceptible or resistant as, as um, Dr. Van Fleet. I would, I would think so. I would agree with that one. They're almost genetic twins, just a slight difference. Maureen was wondering if you can address hot weather watering for roses, for instance, schedule, time of day, type of systems, things like that. Yeah, and much earlier, someone made a comment that roses need five to seven gallons of water a week, which sounds absurd to me, um, maybe in an arid climate. Um, we don't, the, our, the Arboretum Rose Garden does not have an irrigation system. There's no water being, um, it's not being irrigated on a regular basis. And we only water it when we are in an extended dry spell. Otherwise, they thrive with just um, normal rainfall. So, um, you know, if you think if if the plants seem drought stressed, yes, give them a good soaking. Otherwise, just leave them to uh, normal precipitation. Yep, my my little china doll of rose at home gets water 
when it's super dry outside and I think it might die because it is too dry and that's the only time it gets water. Yeah. Um, I had a little personal message over here directed to me and uh, someone was just wondering, where did you work when you worked in a rose garden? It was a private estate in Hills. Okay, private estate. Um, I don't know if any of it exists. Um, the owner, I worked there from 79 to 89 and the owner of the Rose Garden, she and her husband retired there in 1956. So you would imagine by um, 1989, she was up, uh, he had her, died her years earlier uh, during the time I worked there. But by 1989, she was up there in the years and died probably about 1992 or so. And it's gone through several owners, so I'm not sure any anything remains at the garden. Okay, great. And I think that takes care of the questions. If anyone has a last minute question, you are more than welcome to ask it. We certainly encourage you to unmute yourself. You can ask it live and in person. We can chat with you. Otherwise, put it in the chat itself and we can help answer your question. We want to say thank you. These sessions with you guys have been absolutely wonderful uh, during the whole time, COVID and all of that stuff. This was a um, an escape, and it started that way, entertaining uh, information, and went from there. So that we are avid watchers every Wednesday, and we want to say thank you so very, very much to both of you. Well, thank yes, you very I much, agree. Mary. Thank you. Okay. I want to echo that. This is Sally from... Seal Rock, Oregon. Hi, Sally. Hi. Going to miss you guys a lot. Oh, you can only imagine how much we're going to be missing everyone as well. It's a oh. tough decision, but uh, hopefully it'll be an exciting adventure that's uh, coming up in the near future. Oh, good. Stay in touch. It has, has been I've, a lot of fun. I've enjoyed it, too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank, and thank you from Brock Hill. We'll be back again next week with a great program. Doug will be talking about how to transplant plants in hot weather. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.